Hey everybody, Kyle from Fixed Dish. Uh, as you can tell, I'm in a hotel room uh, doing some training over the next couple of days, uh, working on electric forklifts and learning about some of their systems. But uh, anyways, welcome back to Fixed Ish. Today I'll be covering some of your frequently asked questions. This will be a slightly different format than uh, my usual repair videos. If you already follow me, you probably know what I do for a living. Uh, but if you are new here, I'll fill you in with what I do. I am a mobile mechanic in the material handling field. Uh, this can extend anywhere from pallet jacks over to multi-million dollar rail cars, uh, rail car movers. Uh, this video, uh, I will be covering topics such as how did you start? Uh, did you go to school for this? Uh, are those company tools? And more. Uh, this video will be geared towards uh, the newer or unfamiliar with the industry, uh, changing careers, and even those who have been doing this for a while. I'll provide some unique insights, tips, and some of my personal opinions. I guess the first thing to do would be to define some of the roles that you may fall into. Uh, there is a shop technician, preventative maintenance technician, mobile or field technician, uh, auto technician, there's HVAC technician, heavy equipment, in-house tech, uh, resident tech, and I'm sure there's a lot more than that that I'm missing. From here on out, you'll hear me use the terms such as technician or uh, mechanic, mobile technician, mobile mechanic, and I use those interchangeably. Uh, I do realize that there's a difference between the two, but for the sake of the video, uh, I'm speaking in generalities. If you're not aware, a mechanic is someone who is generally very good at hands-on uh, and has a great mechanical understanding. A technician is someone who typically works on complex systems, electrical, hydraulic, uh, air, uh, and they deal with schematics, um, uh, drawings, things like that. And they're a little bit more involved. Uh, they do a lot of what mechanics do and, and a little bit more of the technical stuff. Okay, so I guess from here we'll move on to the uh, general gist of this video as far as, uh, you know, those who are either getting into this field, new to the field, maybe changing roles. Uh, and actually, this is a lot for those who are already in the role. Uh, maybe let's bring some uh, unique insights on things that you haven't considered or thought about. Uh, but if there is something that I miss along the way, feel free to drop that in the comments. So you want to be a mechanic. There are quite a few things to consider when it comes to going into a field such as this, a field mechanic. Um, in this section, um, things can vary quite a bit depending on the type of mechanic you'll be. I am speaking more from the field mechanics since that's what I've primarily done most of my career. Uh, but this can bridge over to some of the other types of mechanics, and I'll try to touch on generalities as far as uh, uh, what a mechanic or field mechanic could be. Why did I become a mechanic? Uh, I became a mechanic mostly because I needed a job. Uh, at the time in my life, uh, economy was kind of all over the place. Uh, my manufacturing job was going away, and I needed to find something to do. Uh, something that made money, sent and paid the bills. Uh, I happened to be fairly handy. Um, I had tools. Uh, I worked on my own projects. To be a successful mechanic, there needs to be a certain level of self-motivation. Uh, motivation doesn't have to look like work, 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 work. Uh, that is not necessarily what I mean. You need to have more of a reason to be there than just to work. Motivation can be a lot like, uh, you know, why does this work? Why was it designed this way? Or how do I change this and still make it function? Or motivation can be, how do I do this better? How do I do it faster? How can I be better than the next guy? Or one of my motivations was I wanted to be the go-to guy. Um, I have sought a lot of those people in my life that, you know, there was somebody who just seemed to be like a general authority over a topic. And, and I gravitated towards those people. And I always thought, man, would it be great to be that guy, the guy that, that knows, the guy that you can go to they can tell you where you need to go, who you need to talk to, where to find that information. It just generally has the answer. So knowing what makes you tick will help keep you on track as to why you're even doing this. I would say next uh, important factor would be uh, physical and mental shape. Um, a lot of people in this field aren't necessarily in the most physical shape. However, they are in generally good shape. They uh, can be flexible. Uh, they can be uh, strong. Uh, some of them are bigger dudes. Um, 
there's a lot of variety in this field, but I feel like what would be important is uh, to know that it's not exactly office work. Um, you are out there busting your butt every day. Uh, there is a lot of physicality to this work. Uh, parts are heavy. You're climbing on, in, around equipment daily. Uh, days can get long. The drives can be longer. And at the end of the day, what's most important is getting that customer going again. So when it comes to doing this day in and day out, it's important to keep your body in relatively healthy condition. Uh, personally, I have found it to be beneficial to work on flexibility. You don't need to be a yoga master or anything like that. But I do stretch every day, a good couple minutes a day, you know, just kind of get out of bed, stretch a little bit, or when you get to work and you get moving around, stretch around a little bit. Uh, I also find it very important to understand how to lift. Uh, I have spent some time uh, weightlifting. It was out of high school, and even as an adult, I uh, continue to learn how to lift correctly. I've spent some time in the gym, uh, learned through some videos or from help from others, learned how to lift cor uh, correctly, doing you know certain types of compound lifts. That way you can position your body correctly. But another reason why I spent time learning uh, how to stretch, how to take care of my body, uh, how to lift, how to lift properly was early on in my career. I think it was my first year or so that I was here. Uh, I actually suffered a fairly serious back injury. It was about nine years ago. Uh, I had to have a spinal fusion done. That was actually after my initial uh, hernia that I had repaired. And then a year later, I had to have a spinal fusion done. So going through about two years of extreme discomfort, uh, and luckily I had a, a good recovery but I learned the importance of being able to uh, stay flexible, remain flexible, and uh, learn how to lift and lift properly, try to take care of your body. Because, I mean, I'm not old, but I'm not super young, and I intend on doing this for quite a while. As physical shape is important, I find it imperative to also have a good mental state. This job is challenging. However, it can be highly rewarding. Nothing's better than getting your butt handed to you over the simplest of things, but then turn around and figure out something that no one else could. Some of the things that I find that help me keep a clear mind is having good music, uh, the drive time. Uh, like I said, I'm a mobile mechanic, uh, so I drive around quite a lot, but having that drive time, that little bit of break in between, uh, that's a great way to clear your mind. Uh, good communication, always kind of knowing where you stand with your customer, with your uh, peers with your boss, etc. Uh, that that clear line of communication can uh, ease a lot of stress and therefore make uh, you a little more confident, a little more sure of yourself. Also, I would uh, argue to say that a heavy dose of medication helps a little bit. <laughs> Not all these technician jobs are customer facing, uh, but the ones that are customer facing, I would say, are probably uh, a little more challenging. Uh, because not only are you having the stresses of figuring something out, but then you're having to turn around and explain that to your customer for somebody who is not technical themselves. So that in itself is a slightly stressful. If you're getting into a new career or change of career, some of the things that you'll want to ask, for example, I'm a road technician. So what is required of this job? Uh, most times it's a good driving record. I mean, if you don't have a, a valid license. I mean, you're not going to be a road tech. Uh, sometimes there are some special classifications. Uh, some of them could require special licenses, special endorsements. Uh, do you have to have a med card? That could affect the fact that you even get a DOT license. And there are other several different types of uh, specialized licenses that are out there. It just kind of depends on what you'll be doing. Those would be some critical questions as far as when you're sitting down in the job interview. Uh, what do I need to have to be able to even participate in this field or this uh, line of work? And now let's talk about the all important thing that a lot of mechanics want to know, tooling. This would be something you're probably very curious about. Uh, some of you probably already know. Um, I'm going to separate this into two categories, uh, what you need and what you want. Uh, before I go too deep into this, there's also a consideration as far as how much are you willing to buy versus how much are you willing to spend? Those may seem like the same thing, but they have a very different meaning. And um, I'll try to define that as far as what I mean. Let's just start with some of the basics. Uh, what do you need? Uh, 
First, you will need a variety of screwdrivers, uh, your average uh, quarter inch, three eighths, half inch sockets. Uh, and I, I mean, those is like an average set. Uh, so for example, like your three eighths set, they usually go uh, like uh, three eighths to 19 or three eighths to three quarter, uh, 10 mil to 19. Uh, depending on where you buy your kits, they could come in a variety of sizes, but I would say quarter inch, three eighths, half inch, sets of sockets, a variety of pliers that could be, you know, needle nose, uh, channel lock, uh, which are water pump pliers. Um, you could have uh, lineman pliers, uh, slip joint pliers, um, uh, just a, a variety of pliers, depending on situations you get into. Uh, wire strippers, I mean, I don't really consider that a plier. Um, but I'd say wire strippers would be important. Um, and then wrenches, uh, just like the socket sets, I would say you need to get a variety of wrenches. So like your combination wrenches, uh, maybe some line wrenches, um, uh, offset angle wrenches. Um, if you need to get into some bigger stuff, maybe like crow's feet, but I would say it's a little more specific, but you need to get wrenches and sets. Uh, I would say start at, you know, quarter all the way up to uh, inch and quarter. Uh, there are some, you know, uh, hydraulic lines and things like that. They get pretty big, pretty quick. Uh, so I'd say you need to at least get yourself up into that inch and quarter uh, or like 32 millimeter. I think that's what that translates into. Um, and I would definitely go SAE and metric. Uh, you want to have yourself a tape measure. I mean, you measure stuff all the time, hose length, uh, you know, if you're in forklifts, how long is your forks? You know, there's some components that are measured out. Uh, and you have to order them based on measurement. So tape measure, um, a variety of hammers. So, you know, you've got your ball peen, maybe like a claw hammer to open crates, um, uh, like mallets. Uh, I love using a drilling hammer, uh, which is basically like a little two pound mini sledge, uh, maybe like a four pound sledge. I would say all the way up to probably like an eight pound sledge hammer. So just have yourself a variety of hammers. Um, I like a punch and chisel set. Uh, it doesn't have to be anything specific, but I would say if you had, you know, a, a roll bag of variety of uh, chisels, you know, Harbor Freight's a great one for that if you're just getting started. Uh, definitely a multimeter. Uh, there's a lot of stuff anymore that's electronically controlled. Uh, a variety of light sources. Uh, get yourself, you know, a couple different flashlights, either be like a pocket flashlight or uh, like a small portable flashlight. I like those because you can set them up in different angles and that way you don't have as much shadows uh, assortment of allen keys and some kind of set uh it could be just the l allens you can get some bit drivers uh, just get yourself a variety they don't have to be expensive uh, a grease gun i mean you're pretty much going to run into something somewhere that you need to grease uh, i would consider that your basic uh tools that would get you by as a mechanic early on uh, and you can probably do about 80% of everything that's out there with just those tools alone. Um, and then the second thing I would say is, uh, what do you want? Um, and these, I would still say are basic, but they do make your life a lot easier. Um, so battery tools, uh, I myself use Milwaukee tools. So like a half inch impact, a, uh, battery power ratchet, but you could also do pneumatic doesn't necessarily have to be battery. You can do pneumatic. So I would say battery or pneumatic uh, impact, um, ratchet, uh, uh, drill, um, air hammer. I'd say air hammer is pretty useful for a lot of things. A grease gun, like a pneumatic grease gun or air or electric grease gun. Uh, a power probe. Uh, it's a way to supply power and grounds to circuits. It takes a little bit of know-how. It's kind of a basic tool, but it requires a little bit of uh, knowing how circuits work so that way you don't cause expensive uh, oopsies. Uh, electrical testing equipment, so along with the multimeter, maybe a variety of probes or um, maybe a way to test a uh, load on a battery, things like that. Uh, but back to what I brought up earlier, uh, the difference between what you're willing to buy versus what you're willing to spend. So yes, you are willing to buy the tool to do the job, but what are you willing to spend on that tool? Sometimes the brand name, 
will determine the quality. That also determines the price a lot of times. Um, I would like to go the, into this further in detail as far as tooling. I know you guys have tons of questions about tooling, uh, but I'd like to go in this a little further on a separate episode. So if that's something you'd like to see, uh, you know, we'll go ahead and put a comment down below. Uh, but I would like to go into depth as far as the uh, willing to buy versus willing to spend and kind of how I get by. Um, I mean, I do own some expensive tools. I own some cheaper tools as well. So I, I feel like there's a fair compromise and I feel like there is a right way to go about it depending on what your uh, career is and the type of work you do. All right, let's move on into uh, skill sets. So one of the things you want to consider is what is your current experience level and how does that fit into this industry or the industry you're going to move into? Uh, this will require some self-evaluation, a little bit of research probably. Um, so don't be afraid to ask questions, especially if you're looking at getting a new job. Uh, for example, when I started this current job, uh, I did not have any specific experience relevant to this job. But I did have some experience that was pertinent to what this job would be. Uh, I worked on my own personal vehicles. I uh, worked on friends' vehicles. Uh, I hung out with people who worked on some higher end equipment. So I always, uh, you know, put myself in with those conversations and try to, you know, pick up what I could from conversation. Uh, so that means that in working on some of my own stuff, I had familiarity with tools, uh, terminology, um, ways to research, because uh, I didn't know everything and uh, I was too poor to pay people, so I had to figure it out on my own. So, so you'll need to look into the job that you're doing and to what skills that it will require and what do you do right now that fit that. And I think that would uh, help you out quite a bit as far as getting into that job or career that you're trying to. Then you want to look into skills that you need. Uh, again, this is going to be an honesty thing on your part. Um, the best place to know the skills that you'll need is the application itself. Uh, application, a lot of times, will tell you a, a list as far as, you know, you'll need these things or they're wanting, you know, these proficiencies. Uh, no candidate matches everything on there. Uh, look at this like a bullet point list to begin with and see what boxes you can check off and then see which ones you don't and um, where maybe your gaps are. If you're looking at a bullet point and trying to think with yourself, you know, is that something that I possess as a skill? Uh, the way I try to quantify that would be, uh, do you have enough experience that you could talk to somebody intelligibly for a few minutes uh, about that skill set and that you're willing to conversate and show some level of knowledge? Uh, I would consider that that you have that skill or some of that skill. Uh, as introductory as it might be, um, a lot of people are overly critical of themselves and they think, oh, I'm not great at that. So obviously I don't have that skill set. But, you know, it doesn't take much to uh, have a basic set of knowledge that is more than enough to get you through uh, a, a topic or a challenge or something that you might run into. So I'd say as long as you can conversate somewhat intelligibly um, on a certain topic, I would consider that you have some skill uh, in there and that would qualify you there. But again, self-evaluation, I mean, you're going to have to look at yourself and see what you think. And then you'll want to look at uh, development. And how do you develop? Uh, I can hear it now. I mean, I can see it on your face. Uh, I'm a hands-on learner. Well, you know, we all learn well hands-on. Uh, but I feel like this is kind of a cop-out answer. Uh, there is no way that you can be hands-on with everything to be able to learn it. And that is not the only way to develop a skill. I know everyone feels like they're a hands-on learner, and that is the only way to develop skills. But I promise you it's not. You can't always be hands-on learning prior to working on a specific piece of equipment or a certain job, especially when you get on your own. You'll be in a situation that's a first for you, and you will have to rely on some uh, basic knowledge, basic skills uh, to help um, troubleshoot your way through it. I would implement uh, with those basic skills uh, what I call objective troubleshooting. Uh, prove what you can prove, research what you can, and guess the least. That most oftentimes will get you through a lot.
uh, here what here's what I would consider a few helpful development tools uh, that I would consider a skill itself uh, being resourceful uh, self training I mean being able to like, read something and then implement it that's self training uh, and then job aids most of your jobs that you go through they'll have something whether it be books or online training or they'll send you to training etc uh, utilizing those job aids uh, and and doing it successfully I would consider that a skill as well and on to the uh, what I would consider probably the most curious more than tools is money and you know, what kind of money can you make in this industry uh, everyone looks at the almighty dollar uh, I do agree that there's a certain level of income that you can deal with uh, in order to get you where you want to go uh, first thing you'll want to do is look at the job type and the potential path that it follows uh, for example you could start out as a shop technician PM tech in-house tech field service uh, you need to look at where that path takes you and sometimes it's uh, possible to know what kind of money that can make you uh, because you can be, let's say, a uh, PM tech. Uh, there is a cap to how much money you can make changing oil. And you can be the greatest PM changer in the world, but you're not going to make over X amount of dollars. Uh, but if you want to make X amount of dollars more, uh, you may want to move over to being, let's say, a, uh, a field mechanic. Now, you may start out low on the totem pole. However, the cap on that is quite a bit higher than the PM tech. So sometimes lateral moves um, are required, or you may even take a little bit of dip uh, in order to get into that next pathway to make that higher income level. Um, so that's kind of what I mean that you need to look at, you know, what, what do you have to have and what can you deal with? So with that being said, you need to look at the career progression itself. Uh, many people always say, you know, what's your five year plan? What's your 10 year plan? What's your 20 year plan? Um, in this field, I would say that you need to probably look at two years at a time. Uh, main reason I look at it two years at a time is it is so easy to get stagnated because five years, that's a ways away. Uh, and there's no wrong with no reason why you can't have a five year plan, a 10 year plan. But I would say in order to be constantly progressing, I'd be looking two years at a time. By doing two years at a time, you give yourself an opportunity to work on things that are immediately within your control. You give yourself that next stepping stone to progress your career. I would constantly be looking two years ahead. It's not a bad idea to have a longer term plan, especially if you're looking at, you know, moving different states or doing this or doing that. But if you're doing two years at a time, I would say it's very easy to uh, set yourself up uh, making the moves required to get the training you need to talk to the people you need to talk to and, and get you to where you want to be in your career. Uh, another thing that I would say that's probably pretty important in a career like this is, you know, what are some of your goals and morals? Um, obviously we all have the goal of making money, uh, developing, uh, in your career, and becoming a high functioning person in your career. Uh, no matter what your goal is today, I promise you that those goals are always changing. It's, it's just that some of them take priority over another in the moment. Everyone's always trying to make more money, but there's a way to make more money and there's also a way to become more valuable. When it comes to money, if you develop yourself, you add value, and with value comes that money. Uh, morals, this could be kind of an interesting topic. Um, not like the morals you have of life, even though they do pertain to what you do for a living. I mean more like a professional moral. Uh, so I pose this question to you. What's one thing that you feel that defines you and your work ethic? Let me explain. Uh, for myself, uh, I feel that anything I do, touch, needs to be correct when I give it back to the customer. I won't do anything that's just good enough, uh, or, oh, that'll be okay, or they'll never notice. Uh, the phrase, it looks good for my house, drives me absolutely insane. Of course it looks good from your house. You don't have to deal with it. But this is your job, your company, your reputation. Pick one, it doesn't matter. It still represents your quality as a technician. So I'd like to close this off with 
uh, some caveats and maybe kind of round things up here a bit. Uh, a lot of a lot of what we talked about here will de- depend on who you're working for. Uh, is it for yourself, a company, a customer? It will also depend on the type of technician you are. Uh, this will determine your scope of work, um, what you're required to do, and how much effort you'll need to put in on and off the clock. Uh, to be a technician, it's more than just a nine to five job. Uh, you have to have that curiosity, that drive, and the willingness to learn. Take some of these points I've given and look at them on an individual basis and answer them honestly for yourself. That is really the only way to be fair to yourself and will give you an opportunity for success. One thing people don't give credit to field technicians enough is that even though the majority of us don't hold a college degree, uh, a lot of them are probably the smartest most clever individuals you've ever met. This is somewhat becoming a dying trade. Uh, It is still in high demand. I recently read that for every five technicians that retire, they're replaced by one uh, up and coming technician. Look around, there are a ton of jobs that are open to this day in many fields, but they're all basically mechanics and technicians. Uh, So uh, what I kind of alluded to earlier is somewhat of a personal story, uh, kind of myself as a uh, mobile technician. Um, So early on in life, I decided I wanted to be a businessman. I went to college for um, international business. I started taking classes in um, foreign ethics. and uh, Mandarin Chinese and foreign business policy and all those types of things. And while I was in school for that, I decided I needed to get a job and it should probably be like in an office or business setting. So I started out working at an insurance company and I worked there for six years. And at the end of that, kind of realized this is not for me. Um, Now, in amongst doing that as a profession, I always kind of enjoyed on Uh, tinkering with stuff. I'm kind of a curious mind myself. Um, So once that job ended, they were actually taking that job and selling it overseas. So uh, I took that opportunity to move on and I wanted to do something a little more hands-on. Locally, a John Deere manufacturer was hiring. So I uh, got a job as a uh, manufacturing uh, technician there. I uh, started off assembling while I was going to school uh, to learn how to run a CNC machine. So I went to the local college and learned how to uh, run a CNC uh, program G code and uh, do tool setup. And that's something I did for almost a year. And in the off season, they'd break down the machines, the, the, the people who built the CNC machines, they would send in their Mori Siki people who uh, was the manufacturer and they'd break down the machine and, and fix it. And I didn't want to go back to assembling when that happened. And so I decided to take up uh, another skill and they offered welding classes. So I went uh, to welding school and learned how to weld. <clears throat> and again, went to the local college there to learn how to weld. And in the winter times, I would weld at John Deere. Uh, ultimately in 2013, they did a gigantic uh, downsizing and they ended up laying off like over 3000 people uh, and over the course of several months and it's a union job. So my number came up and, uh, they let us know that they're going to let us go. They gave us three weeks notice, which was kind of nice. Uh, so in that time, uh, I kind of looked around, asked around, um, and my neighbor at the time, he showed me a lot of the things of how to work on my race car at that time. I was very young. I didn't know a whole lot. didn't have a whole lot of tools and, and he helped me out. Anyways, I told him that uh, I was looking for a job and I was curious if anybody was hiring. And he said, well, uh, I'm hiring. And I knew he worked at a material handling equipment company and uh, he was hiring mechanics. And my response to him was, as dude, I have never wrenched on something professionally in my life ever. Uh, so I don't really know if I can do that. And he just kind of said, Hey, you know, I've, I've seen what you do. I, I know how you learn and, and we've talked a lot. I think you'll be fine. So he hired me on, um, relatively quickly. He started me off as a PM technician. So, you know, changing oil, uh, it was quite a downturn in pay. 
compared to what I was making in my manufacturing job, but it's, it's something I needed. I needed money. And he kind of told me, you know, the career path that you could probably take here and the money you could possibly make. Uh, so anyways, I started as a PM technician. Uh, after I think it was even a year, he said, hey, you know, why don't you go out and do some of these repairs? Uh, you've got some tools, you know, let's see what you can do. Sent me out doing some repairs. I uh, had a good amount of success. I did a couple training classes along the way. I did a lot on my own because um, they offered us training. And I mean, I wanted to know what I was doing. So I spent a lot of time doing those trainings. I talked to a lot of people. Uh, I made good friends. I networked. I uh, absorbed every opportunity that I could. And, um, and in addition to some of the classroom trainings that I take, uh, at work, I, at home also, uh, try to research where some of my gaps are. So, you know, learning, uh, hydraulics more in depth. Uh, I use the YouTube channel, uh, lunchbox specials. They're fantastic for that. Um, learn a lot of electrical things online. Um, I tinker myself with some electrical here and there and, uh, in doing all those things, taking all those courses, and, you know, applying yourself 110% every day, volunteering for projects, et cetera. Uh, over the 11 years I've done this, I am now a lead technician. I carry three master certificates through my work. I'm working on my fourth one right now. And uh, training in products that we carry but aren't really able to carry a certificate in uh, just for myself because uh, I'm curious and I want to know what I'm working on. And so I'll just kind of every once in a while spend a little bit of time doing a training course here or there and trying to expand my knowledge. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's how I got here. Um, that's, you know, my level of understanding as a mechanic. And um, this is my take on if you want to become a mechanic or get into this field or change careers. It's a fantastic career. There is a lot of money to be made. There's a, a lot of uh, freedoms to this type of job. Uh, a lot of it comes down to, you know, who you are, how you apply yourself, etc. So hopefully this, uh, shed some light on, uh, some of the questions you may have as a younger person, uh, maybe, uh, someone who wants to get in this type of career, or even for those of you who are in this career and maybe aren't necessarily excelling and not sure why, uh, hopefully this, uh, answered some of those for you, but, I appreciate the time, appreciate you listening, and uh, we'll see you next time, guys.